Welcome to the Early Access Podcast, episode number four. It is August 27th, 2019. Check us out on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. We have made it one full month in this podcast, and to celebrate, absolutely nothing will change. Uh, but we got a couple things to talk about today. I will be leaving. Uh, I know last week I said I was going to change the day of the podcast. Uh, we're going to keep doing this at Tuesdays at 9. I move my schedule around. But I think we have one more episode after this. Yeah, we got one more episode after this before I leave to go to Japan. And uh, after that, we'll have a show talking about what I did while I was there. Maybe we'll even do one while I'm there. Or maybe I'll bring my little portable microphone and take a voice clip. I don't know. But uh, that that is not going to be uh, regular shows on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. when I'm in Japan from September 9th to the 22nd, I think is when I come back. Or I leave on the 8th. Uh, until the 22nd, but I get there on the 9th because they're like 17 hours ahead or something crazy like that. All right, because this is a gaming podcast, I got to talk about the Modern Warfare beta, which was this last weekend. Uh, the 2v2 gunfight beta for Modern Warfare was live exclusively on PS4, and because I work all weekend, I only managed to play a couple of rounds. I think I didn't even play a full hour. I literally played like three or four matches. One of the matches... Uh, as as happens when you're not playing with teammates, I bit the bullet and I went and I braved the online matchmaking system. And it was very small sample size, so it wasn't that bad. But I did have one guy leave out of three or four matches. The other two uh, completely dominated. Uh, they're just random, I'm sure, children online trying the Modern Warfare beta. It's kind of like Christmas when everyone gets Call of Duty. Uh, who didn't get it back in like October or November. They get on on Christmas and they're all new to the game and they're just casual COD players because otherwise they would have just got it right away. Um, so you could just beat up on people. Um, level one's everywhere. It was great. But I really like... I, I don't have much to say about the game because I, I didn't play it very much. But one thing I do like is the 2v2 format because 2v2, uh, I feel like I'm completely in control of what's happening. There's no like random ninth teammate like there would be in ground war going for a flank and shooting me in the back of the head uh or like dumb people flipping the spawns or anything like that if you're trying to spawn trap in the original modern warfare which seems weird to say like back in cod 4's bog you would be uh spawn trapping people either on the wall side or down near i think the wall side was always easier to spawn trap uh than the anti-air cannon no i think Kiel, did you play much COD 4? Not a lot, actually. Well, one of those one of those two sides on Bog on uh, COD 4 was insanely uh, easier to spawn trap than the other. And so you'd have people messing that up. If you weren't playing with a full team of six, uh, you'd have someone run in there and flip the spawn, and it was all bad. High Rise was another one of those, except that map is in Modern Warfare 2. Uh, but in 2v2s, I really feel like I, I can control the action. Um, I... Lucky me, I, luckiest man in the world. I had a random teammate do a call out. Uh, he he literally all he said to me was, "Hey man, they're going around." And so I just turned around and shot them both in the back of, uh, or both in the face because they were expecting to shoot me in the back of the head, which just comes to prove how insanely overpowered microphones are, uh, and and being willing to communicate with your one other teammate. But I really like the two v two format. Uh, I'm probably not going to get it on launch even though I just called people who don't get COD right away on launch. Noobs. But I'm not going to get it on launch uh, because I, with Infinity Ward's track record, Modern Warfare 2's uh, one-man army noob tubes, Modern Warfare 3's death streaks, uh, Ghost had that glitch for like a month where you couldn't defuse the bomb and search and destroy, and then Infinite Warfare completely messing up the whole concept of specialists. Like the whole point of specialists in Black Ops 4 or Black Ops 3, uh, even though people don't like them, is that you see a specific character and you know what that character is going to do. Battery in Black Ops 3 either has a war machine or kinetic armor. And when you when you see that, you know, you're not going to expect her to do something insane. In um, Infinite Warfare, they gave each character, what, three abilities? Um, so it was more unpredictable. So uh, d don't like Infinity Ward's recent track record of games. And so I'm, I'm very wary with Modern Warfare. I loved all Treyarch's games. That's why I get those all on launch. But don't pre-order your games, people. Uh, and I, I want to go back on this because I had a flashback earlier when I was thinking about bringing this up on the podcast. I, I don't know 
this was unacceptable for the time, but in 2019, people would be rioting on Twitter. There was a death streak in Modern Warfare 3. For those for those of you who are too young to have played Modern Warfare 3 uh, or were fortunate enough to skip it, there's a death streak in Modern Warfare 3. If you died four times in a row, I think it was four, um, the next time you went down, you would go down with a C4. And you could detonate it, or after you got finished off, you would explode. It It is unbelievably annoying to be on a 20 kill streak and you gun a guy down and he just explodes. I don't know who thought from Modern Warfare 2 that death streaks were a good idea so they should put them in Modern Warfare 3 and then add one that effectively gives you a free kill. I mean, in Final Stand, you go down with your assault rifle, but you still have to shoot the guy, right? I mean, yeah, you're down with an assault rifle and there's an invincibility period, but at least you have to aim and shoot a guy, kind of. With Dead Man's Hand, you can literally be the biggest potato and you just explode and kill someone. There'd be times, too, where I'd be on like a 20 kill streak and I'd drop a guy and I knew he had Dead Man's Hand. So I'd start backing away from him and then one of my teammates would shoot the guy and kill me. Uh, there's just no winning. There's no countering and getting around it. Same thing with Free For All. If you went to go play Free For All, um, someone came in and third party and blew that guy up, which blew you up. Unbelievably annoying. Point is, uh, I'm not a big fan of Infinity Ward. Uh, pretty much none of their games I'd classify as anything higher than like a C tier Call of Duty. So uh, with Modern Warfare coming out, I mean, it has caught my attention with Gunfight. I'm really liking that. And the, new, the whole new direction they're taking with the game of being more gritty and violent, I find to be super interesting. But uh, I don't know if this is something I'll get right off the bat because I, I don't know if they're a, they're a company. I mean, after putting out, what is it? Modern Warfare 2, Modern Warfare 3, Ghost, and Infinite Warfare. After putting out four stinkers, in my opinion, in a row, uh, I'm not sure if they're one of those companies that I'll want to continue to even be interested in buying their games. I'm going to talk about another company uh, a little bit on the show that uh, whose games I, I don't believe in. But I've had a couple. Um, I've had a couple people, more than a couple people today on my Twitter feed. So Borderlands Three has announced some kind of like teaser with Fortnite. Um, they posted like this big Fortnite artwork mural thing, uh, and there was the psycho from Borderlands Three there in the bottom left of the picture. And uh, what the announcement was, was that using your Epic Games creator code, um, people can get a percentage off. I don't want to say um, the incorrect number, uh, but I think it was like 5, 8, or 10%. It's one of those three numbers, I'm pretty sure. Two, two, five, eight, ten. Those are going to be my four guesses. Um, but the point is, with your Epic Games creator code, you can get a certain percentage off of uh, Borderlands 3 if you pre-order. And uh, just an absurd amount of people. Now, we've, we've entered an interesting age since TwitchCon 2 in San Diego back in... What was TwitchCon 2, Kuehler? It's like 20... 2016. 2016, 2016. you right. Back in 2016, when TwitchCon announced um, Amazon Prime, um, I did not anticipate... Or not TwitchCon announced Amazon Prime, you idiot. TwitchCon announced Twitch Prime. I did not expect the sheer influx of people talking about uh oh be sure to subscribe with twitch prime you'll get free emotes it's a free subscription just link your amazon prime like you've heard you've heard the spiel a billion times if you watch literally any twitch um twitch streamers are always pushing twitch prime and this is me being like an old school twitch streamer who didn't ever really take advantage of twitch prime because my time was before that um but everyone's pushing that and i understand like you gotta hustle you gotta make your money it does does get annoying um, but you got to plug, man. And I can respect that to some extent. People are, every time a new Fortnite skin comes out, I see people on my Twitter feed, hey, use creator code Tom. Uh, it costs you no extra money and you buy this Fortnite skin and I get X percent. And now people are using their creator codes for Borderlands 3. Um, Mixer now is doing their own thing where if you buy an Xbox Game Pass with someone's creator code, then um, that creator gets a certain amount of percentage off that Game Pass purchase. And so my entire Twitter feed is people plugging the Xbox Game Pass, their Fortnite creator code, pre-order Borderlands 3 with this creator code, 
use my Amazon affiliate link for this thing, use my Twitch Prime sub for this thing. And I realize I have a, uh, a skewed Twitter feed towards content creators because a lot of them are personal friends of mine uh, or people I know or I'm interested in. But holy crap, everyone has something to plug nowadays. And, and you know, that's coming from me. We don't have any sponsors on this show yet. Soylent, looking at you. Um, but, oh my God, everyone everyone has some kind of sponsorship or affiliate code in the year of our Lord 2019. And if you were to go back even as far as like 2012, um, or I think I started streaming, what, in 2013 is about when I started streaming, October 2013. Uh I guess the biggest thing that that we had back then was maybe like Gamma Labs or G Fuel codes. Uh, maybe that was even a couple of years later, or DX Racer affiliate codes. Um, but now now there's a code for absolutely every software service, chair, uh, bag of French fries at McDonald's that you can buy. And and I respect to some extent the the people out there plugging it and hustling and trying to make it as a content creator. But also, holy crap, all of you have codes for everything. It's, it's getting a little annoying, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do to pay the bills because uh, being a content creator is not a source of income that is by any means stable or, or by any means predictable. And so you gotta get everything you can. And, and in a lot of the ways that there are to support, um, with, with, for example, the Xbox um, subscription service, that, if that's something you'd buy anyway and it doesn't cost you any extra money to use someone's code to help them out. If you have Amazon Prime because you like supporting a company that uh you know doesn't treat workers too well but you want some fra- you want some fast shipping i'm not gonna lie I, I i get that fast shipping all the time i like it um there's no there's no harm to you using your twitch sub on someone it gives them a little bit of extra cash so there's on the consumer side there's nothing for them to lose and not paying any extra money to support someone uh, but the plugs are non-stop all the time Maybe, and maybe this will just make you more hyper aware when people when you're watching a Twitch stream and then they mention their Amazon Prime sub, uh, or or you're scrolling through Twitter and someone mentions that you can get twenty percent off um, this new cool shirt on on the Design by Humans store if you use this code. I don't know. Maybe people will be more aware of it, uh, but I see it absolutely everywhere. The former CEO of Beat Saber, Jaroslav Beck, has announced this is a super cool thing. Uh, I am extremely happy that he's doing this with beat sabers incredible success i'm actually going to go on vrlfg real quick uh i didn't bring this up earlier but vrlfg shows how many people are currently playing a vr game at any given time it is 9 56 p.m on a tuesday night uh, pacific standard time there are 945 people playing beat saber who are connected to the internet on steam the max number of players today was 1,459. That's on Beat Saber. Pavlov's max players was was 1,043. Pavlov's also killing it. The next highest game is Blade and Sorcery at 358. So from first place to third place, we have 1,459 to 358. That's just a little bit of perspective uh, on how Beat Saber is absolutely killing it as far as VR games and VR game player base goes. Um, so one of the things that uh, the former CEO of Beat Saber is doing personally is investing uh, money into other VR games. I'm going to read a quote uh, here from the article on UploadVR.com. At Gamescom this year, Beck said he saw a number of VR games and decided it would be great to put a bunch of money together and start supporting new developers who are creating games or applications for VR and who are thinking a little bit more out of the box because I believe VR desperately needs new directions in game mechanics and overall approach. Beck says it's a personal project. Upload VR reached out to him after he posted the above video on where that quote came from to see what kind of response he's getting. He says he's a bit overwhelmed by that response but interested to see more VR projects providing advice or financial investment. This is super cool for him because I've said it before. The uh, return on investment for a VR game, the, the amount of money that you can put in a VR game and that you can expect to get back out of it, I read the stat back in 2018, is $300,000. And, uh, you know, if you if you have a company that's, you know, a couple people making five digits, uh, you can burn through that money quick. And the average VR development cycle, I mean, it's eight months. It's six to 12. You're not developing a VR game. 
You know, it's, it's not sitting there cooking for two or three years like a Call of Duty would be. So for him to invest uh, into into VR games that might not necessarily have that AAA backing, I find that to be uh, a, a really great thing for the industry that he's doing. Um, but speaking of a AAA backing, I, I said earlier I was going to hate on another game. Space Junkies is a terrible game. Uh, and not to kick them while they're down, but they announced that Space Junkies is ceasing development today. Space Junkies is Ubisoft Montreal's uh, space first-person shooter where um, you fly around and shoot other people. Uh, it's 2v2. I think they announced 3v3 at some point. Absolutely no one was playing it. It's not like I, I look at a game and I want it to fail. What happened was I played the game and felt it would fail. And I don't want to come out and say that I was right. I don't, I don't ever want to be like, oh, that that's not going to be successful. And then when I'm right, I'm happy that something didn't turn out to be successful. Uh, but Ubisoft has a history of not treating their multiplayer games very well. Um, For Honor, of course, launched with like their completely broken servers. Uh, they did get dedicated servers like a year after launch. But I'm, I'm going to speak from the standpoint of Assassin's Creed, which not a lot of people knew had a multiplayer a component to it. But starting with Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Assassin's Creed Revelations 3 and then 4. Those all had multiplayers and they were all absolutely bug written and uh, horrendously supported. Um, the servers were absolute garbage. The balance of the game was terrible. There's a patch in Assassin's Creed Revelations that made the most powerful ability, the smoke bomb, even more powerful. Um, the Assassin's Creed series... Multiplayer never got party to work. They had 4v4 game modes, um, but queuing up as a four-man was insanely glitchy in all four iterations of the uh, multiplayer franchise. It was an absolutely garbage um, add-on, a tack-on to the uh, Assassin's Creed single-player games. And so when they announced Ubisoft Montreal, announced Space Junkies, um, I, I had that sour taste in my mouth from having supported the Assassin's Creed multiplayer series for so long. And when I uh, played it, I got to play it early because I um, run an arcade and the arcade versions came out before the public versions. And there was a competition to play Space Junkies. Um, they didn't have basic things like t uh, team selection, map selection. There was a lot of RNG for no reason in the game. What weapon you spawned with was random. Which there's absolutely no no purpose to. I, I I'm not completely against RNG in games. Trading card games have inherent RNG to them. Um, battle royales with the loot systems and hot drops and all that stuff. Those have inherent RNG, and I can I, I can find that as fun. Preparing um, for RNG, risk assessment, um, you know, taking calculated risks based on the percentage chance you'll succeed or fail. I find that all interesting, but spawning with a random weapon, I I don't find interesting at all. Because some are just stronger than others. And so um, it was terrible when the game launched. Um, I was not excited about it at all. And it launched for $40. $40. A multiplayer only VR title launching for $40 is unacceptable. Shortly after, I think they did drop it down to 16 or 18 bucks. Um, but for perspective, Beat Saber, when it launched, was $20, went up to $30 after early access. Um, Pavlov, I'm actually going to look up Pavlov right now. Let's see how much Pavlov is. I think it's like seven bucks. Actually, it probably won't come up for me because I bought it. I'm not, I'm not going to go look it up, but I think Pavlov is something like $7. Um, charging $40 for a VR experience that's multiplayer that requires other people to play, um, to, to shrink a player base with such a high price tag is completely unacceptable. Um, so that really killed their, their launch. And then... They were working on a PC version of the game so PC players can play with VR players. And that's always really interesting. Rec Room supports PC and uh, console, or no, excuse me, PC and VR based gameplay. And PC players who really good with mouse and keyboard have certain advantages, but for example, VR players can blind fire. Um, so it's really interesting seeing um, PC versus VR um, because it's not like console where just aiming with a stick is harder than aiming with a mouse. As far as precision accuracy, VR is, uh, there's so much more you can do with your body. There's so many more options. But then you have the unsteadiness of someone's natural, like, you know, hand moving uh, versus, like, just moving your uh, arm on a, on a mouse pad. Anyway, they were developing uh, a PC version 
so PC players can play Space Junkies with VR players. And they announced today that they are no longer going to be developing that and that Space Junkies has finished development and they're moving on. A smart move for the company because it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. Um, and it is sad to see VR games not do well. But also, I, I have seen Ubisoft um, not do very well with their multiplayer games in the past. Personally, um, with the uh, iterations of the Assassin's Creed multiplayer that never got better, I was very disappointed with that. And so Space Junk is not have high hopes for, and it looks like I was right. I hate to say it, um, but that is completely out. A whole po- the whole thing wrapping up uh, around back to the Beat Saber former CEO investing in other VR games. Just because a VR game has a AAA backing like Space Junkies did doesn't necessarily mean it'll do well. Um, but obviously, the former CEO of the most popular VR game in the world by far is going to have a better idea of what to invest in than you know just someone with a pocket full of cash. Uh, investing in a triple a title so i hope he invests the money well and i hope to see some good things come out of it i i hope i hope that games that he gave money to um you know i I hope i can directly point at hey he gave money to this game and it's doing great because he believed in this idea and this idea is doing really well in vr and so other people should take this great idea and use it um and it'll just further the entire rest of the industry killer do you have a world war one fact before I move on to the next uh, yeah, topic, sure, go ahead. Is it time for that? Yeah, yeah go ahead, because right, I need to take a sip your... of water. All right, is that time in the stream when we talk about the next World War One fact? So early on in the war, we're going straight into this, um, was the Battle of San Fontaine. This was a town near the, in South Africa, so it was owned by England at the time. A German commander, Joachim von Heidenberg, wins over um, the British commander, R.C. Grant. So Germany at this time had a very small team compared to the British. They were... The British were very much well defended in this case, but using some clever tactics and some flanking maneuvers, they were able to completely overturn and capture the Saint Fontaine. Now, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is after uh, the battle was over, this was very, very early in the war, I want to remind you that because that will become more relevant, um, all, the, all the soldiers went over to the well to get water, kind of the only source of water in the area, as Africa is arid. Um, and so the different sides, both the English and the... And the, Brit- and the German side uh, were met at this well and just kind of hanged out together and, and said hello to each other. And then uh, Heidebrecht, the German commander, being a kind of old 19th century gentleman kind of in war, also met with R.C. Grant, the British commander, and they kind of just chatted and discussed the battle after it was over. Uh, Heidebrecht kind of congratulated Grant on his defense. Uh, he said it was a good defense, even though it fell apart at the end. You know, he did a fantastic job. And they just kind of they had this little cheery conversation with each other. These things were a little more common early on in the war. They become obviously very less common as the war went on because they were both outlawed and also it was just harder to be friendly after the amount of destruction that happened at the time. That Nikki, That there? is... Yeah, yeah, that is no joke. I think the most interesting World War I, You've told me a lot of World War I facts, but mm-hmm. I think that is literally the most interesting one because I, that that actually happened to me this weekend. Uh, really? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it all the way back around to Pokemon because I always do. Let's see. So, so there's, there's a lot that goes into card games, right? If you watch professional poker, there are people wearing sunglasses and like scarves and stuff because your neck can show uh, tells as to what you have in your hand. Uh, your eyes is an obvious thing. Um, there, there are people who are like hat, sunglasses, scarf, right? And, and I, I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. Sh- I don't show up to a casual Pokemon league. This isn't a cup. This is just a casual league where people go to play and people who do the best get cards. Um, obviously, there's a prize at stake, but I'm not going in with a pair of sunglasses and a scarf. I am a sweaty tryhard, but um, I didn't have my evolve scarf on me. So I go in there. And and I actually played poker when I was like 12, 13. And I learned a little bit about like hiding tells. Um, and, and, you know, for like, for example, you're playing Pokemon, right? And you, you really want one Pokemon on the field. So it's your turn. You draw a card off the top of your deck. Don't, don't go like, oh, like, you know, like your eyes get wide or like you like nod your head up and they're like, yeah, I needed that card. Don't do any, whatever card you draw, you stone face it. You know, you, you don't want to be like, oh, man. So then your opponent knows, like, oh, he didn't get what he wanted. I mean, there's also reverse psychology there. You can draw a card that you want and go, ah, And then, you know, they're like, oh, is he... There's there's all that psychology to it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I play I play my game uh, against a bunch of people. And anytime you play a game of Pokemon, 
Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not giving away their strategy. You know, we sit down. I'm not telling them what cards I'm running or anything. Um, the battle unfolds. I'm not telling them my strategy. I'm not like, oh, you don't want to do that because I'm going to do this next. Uh, or that next, because there's a little bit of a prize at stake. There, there's some there's some booster packs and all that. So we play out our match, and then afterwards, uh, you know, we talk and 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 um, it was the first match I played. I was like, yeah, man, uh, I've seen your deck before. Um, I, I knew what your long game strategy was, so I actually played this card to counter you afterwards. He was like, oh, dude, that was really smart. And we were like talking about how like his defensive plays and like how I maneuvered the board and how he maneuvered it. And, and so that that's a lot like those generals. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, like and, the war but, happened, uh, the, the battle went on. And then after, you know, after everything said and done, we, I, we sat down and we're like, oh, I like how you played that, Matt. You should try that. And he was like, yeah, and I like how you did that, Matt. So, uh, so it happens in card games too. You know, you learn the matchup as you play. Yeah, you, know, you go there to learn matchups. Uh, and so I, I told him how to maneuver around my deck a little bit better. Uh, and by playing against his deck, I learned how to move around his deck, even though I won. And we ch- we chatted about it and gave each other tips afterwards. So that that's a similar experience to those generals. Oh yeah, it's it's very expected in in things like games, whether it's like card, video, or sport games. But it's just very strange when you yeah, hear war. this for actual war. People people died and got injured, and you know all all these other aspects. But afterwards, they're just kind of chatting with each other, and the soldiers too, kind of just go get water with each other and just kind of like, hey, what's up? Um, and keep in mind, like a lot of people have said that. World War One was kind of the end of the 19th century, because a lot of the ideals of that would make people do this are kind of old war standards. So in 1914, you did see a few cases of acts of friendliness. The most famous one is the Christmas truce, but there wasn't yeah. even the only truce. Like, there were actually multiple cases where things like the Christmas truce happened, maybe not on the same scale. And then there were cases like this one, where like they literally meet each other after the battle, and we're just like, let's, let's look how we went with each other. Um, yeah, so that's, just, just that's, random random facts. It's, this went away very quickly. By 1915, this was mostly gone. And ex- or it had to be very subtle, at least. You, but you couldn't just get out of the trench and go chat with the others. Get out of the trench and chat with the others. See, when, when you say get out of the trench, it's like that versus like pull out of your all your cards out of the discard pile. Yeah, like, something like uh, yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was becoming impossible. There were cases of people like throwing like rocks with messages over the trench to say like we're gonna we're gonna send bombs over like at this hour or something like the artillery squad's gonna 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 fire at this time so like move move away when that happens or get into cover preemptively so like there were little cases of friendliness that would pop up here and there throughout the war but um never really cases of actual fraternization which were very quickly stomped away because that obviously would threaten the very nature and structure of the war um, this isn't, but, is is that an act of now we're getting into war talk is that is that not an act of betrayal for like if i'm if i'm on one side right and i throw a message over like yo artillery's coming you better move like isn't the point of the artillery to hit that guy yeah it is but to a lot of them this happened largely more docile regions of the war where they're just kind of stuck with each other kind of in a stalemate without much major action going on throughout the time so yeah. it's kind of a way of like they're they're you know, they're there maybe like twenty feet away from them sometimes, and so at some point it's just like yeah we're all just kind of stuck here. You might as well try to live it out and then go home when it's all over, you know. Yeah. As if opposed I can... to if you're in like the major battlefields where like they're making major advances, that's obviously going to be more difficult. But like for a lot of those when they're more docile, they're just kind of they're they're not really caring too much. They're not that important, um, and they were able to do that. If I could humanely. Or or if I could just move you, right, and you just just go away uh, instead yeah. of get hit by the artillery, that I, I I could see that. I mean, those are yeah. people on the other side, and these aren't killing machines. Yeah, and and the docility of those regions also made it more easy to tell that they're people. Keep in mind, the commanders and the officers would definitely not allow that to happen. So this was was usually done in secret. That's why you're throwing rocks instead of yeah. like yelling to each other. But even there would be like friendly things. They put like messages on signs and shit to each other. But like. Just kind of a reminder that they're human, but um, just early war had a lot of these kind of direct fraternization moments, and in this case, technically wasn't because uh, the British were prisoners by this point; they lost the battle, but they still kind of chatted, which is something you wouldn't really expect in that situation. Uh, okay, should this, we move on to the next topic? Yes. This actually segues uh, insanely well into the next topic. Uh, so, my man Poon Anners uh, was featured in uh, an article on why.org i actually don't know what why uh stands for it's why w h y y 
uh, org with two Ys. And they were talking about how uh, virtual reality can help PTSD uh, in people who had been in war and veterans. And so this is a quote uh, from the article. This is on uh, YWHYY.org. When we study people with PTSD and put them in an fMRI system, for example, and study their brain activation when they're presented with cues that are uh, reminiscent of the trauma, we see a hyperactivation of the amygdala. Did I say that right, Kula? I mean, dollar. I mean dollar, something. Yeah, I never, sorry. I don't know if it's correct, but close enough. Uh, the fight or flight area in the brain. Uh, we see the hyperactivation of the amygdala, the fight or flight area in the brain, Rizzo said. They react as if it's a real thing. One classic example. A veteran with PTSD may see some trash on the side of a California highway and feel a fear that's as real as the fear felt on an Iraqi highway as an improvised explosive device disguised as garbage exploded. For people with chronic PTSD, these triggers come often and linger for years. A common treatment for this type of issue is exposure therapy. A patient describes a troubling event or a source of anxiety to a therapist over and over again, imagining it, confronting it in a safe setting until it starts to lose its bite. With VR, you don't have to imagine. We have 14 different worlds that represent different contexts in Iraq and Afghanistan, the marketplace and outpost, Rizzo said. Veterans carry a prop gun, their rigs for vehicles, and even a smell device that produces a sense of gunpowder and burning trash. Uh, a clinician can ignite explosions around them, IEDs, at different distances and intensities. They can have jets fly over or helicopters. Using VR has accelerated treatment for veterans when compared to traditional talk and imagine methods, Rizzo said. That's critical because many patients will drop out of treatment too early when they don't see help right away. So what about VR gamers, these players finding relief? Could this be possible? Short answer, he said, yes. Uh, I like to say that, you know, we can get people to confront things in VR that they wouldn't do in the real world. To go into a social situation with a lot of people, to get a person with social phobia to do that, or somebody with autism to do that, they're so anxious, they may avoid it. They may use coping strategies that are less effective, and it's not a therapeutic exposure. But he emphasized guys like Simmons, uh, Simmons, uh, which is Poon Anders' last name, I'm pretty sure. I ne- I, once, I never call people. Um, I never inter- interchange like, people's real name or their like gamer tag. It's uh, like, I always call you your gamer tag or always call you your real name. But uh, it's my friend Poon Anders featured in this article. Guys like Poon Anders who feel like they're finding therap- uh, therapeutic value in VR, they've only discovered a tool, not a cure. And VR is a tool when most used by a clinic. Still, Rizzo said if VR can help people recognize the potential of getting actual clinical help, it's a good thing. A large majority of people with mental health problems never see the inside of a therapy office. You know, they go through life managing and getting by and so forth. He said, never, never seek help. And that's mind numbing. So uh, to sum that all up, what, P- what uh, doctors are using VR for is uh, instead of having veterans sit down and talk through uh, those those scary moments over at the war in the Middle East, uh, they'll have them instead experience them again in VR in a safe setting to realize that now that they're home, uh, they're not in that kind of danger anymore. They don't need to be on that fight or flight alert. That could be dangerous. That could explode. Someone could start shooting at you uh, kind of thing. They're, they're trying to calm them down and realize that they're acclimating back into a society that is significantly safer. Although, you know, we do have shootings in America. Uh, it is... Uh, exponentially safer than you know being out actually fighting for your country and so they're using vr as exposure therapy uh to get people to feel uh, a little bit better when they come home and and reacclimate to civilian life and there was another part of the article uh, you guys can read it for yourself on ywhyy.org there's another part of the article um that said uh, poon anders talks a lot about social vr and this is actually something he's spoken to me personally about uh, where if, if if you're not so good with, with going out, being social, talking to people, you don't want to go hang out at a bar, which to be fair, I, I, th- I think bars, this is my own thing now, I think bars are, uh, too many people accept them as an acceptable place to hang out. I, I really think a bar is not for everyone. Um, you know, a, a bar is somewhere where everyone goes to hang out, drink, have fun, and, and drinking is that social lubricant, go meet girls, uh, whatever, but there's this notion that like to go to a bar, you can do that. Uh, and the, there are other places where you can go out and meet people. Um, but, but the bar just being like the premier place where anyone can do that. I don't, I don't think bars are good for everyone. 
Some people don't drink. Some people want to keep their hearing until they're at least 24. Uh, some people don't like talking to people in big groups. I think I personally am more effective if I'm talking to someone one-on-one -on -one than if I had to be at a table with like 16 people and I had to, you know, talk about something that everyone's interested in or everyone um, can relate to or something pop culture-y. You know, I don't, I don't think bars are meant for everyone is what I'm trying to say. So VR can be that kind of social, like whether it be VR chat or the lobby of like a VR game. Uh, same thing with Pavlov. We were talking about how like after the war, after the Pokemon trading card game, you stand around and talk about what happened. You literally do that in like the Pavlov lobby where uh, you'll be playing five on five and the game will end. And you'll be like, yo, man, I got you. Snuck up on you that time. And so VR uh, is also great for a social tool. And uh, this article highlighted something that I actually didn't even know about, that people are using this clinically. And so that was a cool thing uh, that I found. All right, the last thing I want to talk about before we cut time uh, is I want to start doing this on Instagram. Uh, we were talking about this before the show, r slash creepy asterisks. And what this is, is uh, we might we might hit your cringe limit for the day. I'm going to give you guys a quick uh, FCC warning. But creepy asterisks, asterisks is a subreddit uh, where people post creepy text messages from presumably guys. Uh, I would be surprised if all of the creepy texts that came from the subreddit aren't one hundred percent guys. How, is there a way? You, there's is there a way to describe these texts, Kuehler? <laughs> the, it's like it's like role playing um, through text. In, in like a non-consent, like a person didn't consent to the role play. They're not aware that a role play is going on. When someone texts me, uh, I, I by default, like I'm talking to them as as Nikki. I'm not role playing uh, as anything. Uh, and I assume they're talking to me as them. It's not necessarily a business transaction, but I just... Uh, creepy asterisk texts come from people who don't understand uh, social Social cues. And this literally could have been like a three-hour show of me just reading these. So I wanted to do this thing on Instagram. It almost was. Um, I want to do this thing on Instagram where I, I read these out. And I, I want to do these on the show. And let me know if this makes your teeth fucking hurt listening to them. Or if you think this is hilarious. Or a little bit of a combination of both. Uh, so I'm going to read an example. This one's mild. This is a mild creepy asterisk. Uh, this guy says... Huh. Hi, bite slip. Uh, he, they like add the stutter into their text, uh, and then the, the the bite slip starts and ends with an asterisk. Uh, we're gonna go on to to this one here. Are you going to prom? Uh, the person says, "I'm gonna assume this is a, a guy who asks, are you going to prom?'" And this is a girl saying, "Yeah, you. Yeah, I am. You." And the guy says, "Yes." I, uh, <laughs> awkward chuckles. I was going to ask if you'd like to go to prom with me. It doesn't have to be as a date, but you, you know what I mean. I don't know if I want to go with anyone yet. Sorry. Uh, am I reading these too well, Kuehler? I feel, I don't know how I want to read these and if I want to use these to launch my voice acting career. It's, it's hurting me to listen to it, so I think there's <laughs> some degree of success in this. All right, that's what we're aiming for. All right. Um, here's another one. Creepy guy doesn't like it when you say no. Uh, it's a little, it's a little face with Ashley says, buh. And then the guy says, sorry. And then the creepy person says, hugs. And then the guy says, no, bye bye. And then he gives him the little asterisk face again and says, kicks your ass out, teabags you and slits your throat. Bye. That one, uh, that one in particular, Please. um, accelerated itself really fast, but we, Kuehler picked the gold standard one. There is no dialogue in this one. It is all asterisks start to finish. Furiously pisses on the fire to try to put it out, pulling through the pain of a burning cock and spinning on the fire. It has seven upvotes. Can, can you tell what site this was posted on? Is this... Was this on was Reddit? That Reddit? Was that Reddit? No, I don't think it's Reddit. Is it Face? It's not Facebook. It has like an up and down vote, so it can't be Facebook. Oh, that's a good point. It could be like a Reddit app. Maybe because it has the mm. it has the controls of the options of a Reddit post, right? Except for the yeah. I guess the the star is not really one. I have no idea. 
Really? Okay, I, I, I haven't I, used. I, I don't use enough Reddit to really know like all of the apps and whatever you can use. I, I have to read this one. We're, we're going. We're going for maximum cringe on this one. I, I said I was only going to read four on the show. I have to read this fifth one because I, I feel like I haven't quite got my point across. The previous ones are creepy. This one, this one I think maxes out. I'm going to read this in what I perceive to be this person's voice to be. Um, h- Hello, miss. Walks up timidly. Um, uh, I'm sure you're busy and I, I hope I don't take up t- too much of your time. I j- just was some... Wh- Wondering if you could, um, if it's not too much to ask, it, if you could draw me, looks down at you shyly. Um, this guy's asking if, this guy's asking to get drawn. This, I don't know if anyone stutters this much in real speech, but that's what, that's what creepy asterisk is, um, it's dudes being incredibly associated. And I actually found this, this the pinned post from five, uh, five months ago, super interesting. It's called, Why Are They Like This? These people have severe social skill deficits stemming from a variety of deep-seated psychological issues. They don't have many friends, so their perceptions of reality are shaped by popular culture. Mostly it's a combination of anime, where awkwardness and vulnerability are seen as charming, movies, where the ordinary-looking hero gets the girl sh- through sheer persistence, and, well, porn where the notion of consent ranges from subjective at best to optional at worst. What little social interaction they have occurs online, where the distinction between reality and role-playing often blurs. The life lived online combines with the weird co- pop culture cocktail to create the type of socially stunted person featured on r slash creepy asterisks. And so if you guys want to head over to Instagram.com slash Shampoo, where I will do my best to uh, bone-chillingly read... The most painful one of these I can find. <laughs> I just realized the description of this subreddit is is all in asterisks. Tickles you. <laughs> I, I just read that right now. I was, go follow me on Instagram so that uh, I can read these out loud to you. Um, and And hopefully cause you true pain. Um, because what else have I been put on this earth here to do? All right, well, that's uh, all we got for you guys today here on the Early Access Podcast, episode four, the one-month anniversary. Head over to Spotify and iTunes. We'll be a link down in the description if you're listening on YouTube, so you can listen to the other episodes and give us a rating because that helps out discoverability. If you want to submit questions, head over to discord.gg slash stealth shampoo, and there'll be a form where you can drop us other questions i've been your host dj nikki Kuehler, is producing the show uh we are live on twitch twitch.tv slash dust shampoo on tuesdays at 9 p.m psd we will be live again september 3rd for our last show until i leave for japan on september 8th don't know if we'll be doing shows in japan or if i'll just take voice clips or write notes on things i want to talk about when i come back but after i come back is oculus connect 6 which i think i'm going to And uh, we have one more show next week. Thank you guys for listening. I've been your host, DJ Nikki, and we will see you guys all some other time.